Welcome to the Church of Mavis Radio Show. It's Friday night. Starship Command, Jay McNicholas, Mark Heller. We're flying through the universe right now, and we're going to a nebula and past the black hole. We look like we're on a ship. Come on, we're doing it. We're flying through the universe. I had to go pick up uh, <laughs> Buck Rogers. They need to do. Aren't they going to be bringing Buck Rogers back somehow? I heard something, but you you something. I like That'd this be though because uh, you can't tell where it's at now. I'm sorry, you're there. If you look up a little bit further, it's actually signed by Aaron Gray and uh, um, Gil as well. So. Hell yeah. I remember one episode, it was like this pan dude playing a music thing or something weird. I'd have to see it was weird, but I remember watching it as a kid and there's some kind of weird creature and he kind of looked like the dude from uh, Raisin Arizona, the biker. I don't know if it was him, but maybe it was. I don't know. I'd have to look guy, that episode up. The guy playing that flute playing character is also the guy who's inside the Tweaky suit. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'll have to check that out. He just passed away recently as well. Uh oh! I saw Star Wars the beep 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 parody, <laughs> the naughty. But anyway, uh, it's funny. But back to the show. Oh, I, I went to go pick up uh, Helen's ashes today. My fiance's grandmother who passed, and the funeral home guy gave me a little tour. And I went into the big coffin room and looked around. It was really surreal and creepy. And there's like coffins that say, go home, going home, and U.S. Navy, and, you know, all these different little weird brands on the coffins. But anyway, start, me and Christina started talking to him about the paranormal. And I was like, well, does anything ever happen here? And he said, no. And then uh, he said his father saw a UFO in this area a long time ago over some power lines or something I forget but that was interesting then his mother has some gifts and there's almost like alluding that she might hear weird Bigfoot stuff out in her yard and she has some gifts but those dudes were the two tall uh, funeral dudes that came here to get the body in the hearse and it was like surreal and creepy just like these two tall brothers it was like the Twilight Zone but uh, they were nice but he also asked me well do you th he's Christian which, of course, I, I believe there's some truth to Christ stuff. I don't push it on anyone. Uh, but in my experiences include seeing light beings, so they probably have a boss of some sort. But anyway, he goes, do you think you open any doors doing a paranormal show? And I was like, probably, I don't know. It was 13 years, 13 years on Friday the 13th. <laughs> but anyway, it was just cool talking to a funeral dude. And I got his email to send him some. Yeah, he has Native American uh arrowheads near the spring in his yard and stuff so he want, I'm going to send him some shows with Native Americans that I've done and stuff like that into his email but I didn't get to see where all the bodies are which is probably for the best while there's COVID crap going on I don't want to go in there for sure who knows I don't know if they can still spread it when you're dead probably I don't know it probably still lives on you for a while I would think I'm no expert on it so I don't know but I would guess it would still be uh, spreadable somehow maybe I don't know but I don't I would go in there if there was no COVID that'd probably be too much just be creepy all those body bags and stuff like that and all that craziness well uh you listen to united public radio 107.7 and we got mark heller the return of mark heller <laughs> the return well uh Lately, I've gotten into, I, I used to be in the comics, and I kind of just got into graphic novels because it seems easier just to get those at some point. But lately, I've gotten some of the regular issues of stuff and tried to get some that I think would be, you know, profitable in the future, like from a collector's standpoint, like number ones and stuff like that. But I did get the Batman 89s. Uh, no, I think it's going to be a six-part series. I was kind of hoping to be forever, but I don't. I think it's limited. And... Uh, that seems very interesting. Then it led me to get the Batman graphic novels of the movies from Tim Burton that are out there. Yeah. So, but I know you had said something about that comic in particular. What can you tell us about it? Well, uh, I'm doing a bunch of events now again. And in October, I'm bringing in Michael Keaton's uh, stunt double, the Batman, and Batman Returns. Uh, he's going to be doing autograph signings and stuff. And I talked over with uh, Billy D. Williams' people. And everything that we get him to sign for Batman, Billy's going to sign as well. So I'm going to have a big stack of uh, Batman 89 comics. And uh, we'll be able to, it won't be Michael Keaton, but it will be Dave. And Dave is just as much Batman as Michael was. Because every every fight scene, every major battle scene, 
like that really uh, iconic uh, Batman return scene where he's fighting all the clowns and stuff. That's all Dave. Uh, the rooftop with Michelle Pfeiffer wasn't obviously Michelle Pfeiffer or Michael Keaton. That was her stunt person and Dave. Uh, we're going to have a really neat uh, thing as well. He's going to be doing for the first time ever. He's going to teach people how he fought as Batman in the movie so they can pay. And then we'll have a, we're working with a couple of venues right now to figure out which is the best place. And they'll be able to put a costume on, whether they want to put a Batman suit on or whatever they want to put on. And he's going to teach them how to uh, put a costume on and convincingly uh, do like fight scenes like you've seen the, the superhero movies. But uh, I'm excited because they're going to be signing the comic, and I want to get some of those signs for myself. Even. That's cool. That's cool. It's going to be limited, though, isn't it? Isn't it limited? Like six parts, I thought I read. Yeah, but you never know. I mean, they started doing that with Wonder Woman, then they started doing specials and stuff, and then they keep doing it. So if it's going to make them money, they're not going to stop. I was especially yeah. interested, though, because. Um, they they just they just released the pictures of the Robin. The Robin's going to be in there, and I was curious oh, wow. if they were going to go for a brand new design, or I don't know if you knew this or not. The Robin was actually cast. The costume was made and everything for Batman Returns, and they never used him. It was Marlon Wayans. What? And you can actually, if you look online, you can see some of the leaked photos of the. They didn't show the actual physical suit, but it existed uh, of Marlon Wayans' actual Robin suit, and. Uh, they took out all the Robin sequences. And they took out another couple of different subplots and changed uh, Batman Returns significantly. But the biggest change in Batman Returns was the removal of Marlon Wayans as Robin, which was the original plan. He was cast. He still got paid for it, even though he didn't do it. Because he was cast does, in a suit and everything. Does anyone like Robin? I mean, I'm sure they do, but I don't for some reason. <laughs> I, don't know. Well, I don't know if you saw the big hilaria over Robin today now, over the comic means all the people are having a freak out. They, uh, dc has been working very hard to make this because you know, yeah. So yeah, Robin, Robin, isn't, Robin isn't as hated as Will Wheaton's Wesley Crusher character. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Batman yeah. likes dudes. Apparently, they're doing that a little too much. I mean, I understand doing it with a character so and so, but come on, man, just too much. But uh, yeah. you know, throw somebody out there, maybe a new character. You know, why you gotta, you know. <laughs> Batman's wholesome, but to each their own, you know. I try to not stay out of that stuff. But yeah. the other thing I got was that Garth Ennis Batman Reptilian series. I love Garth Ennis for Preacher yeah. and all that. He did. I haven't read it yet, but I got that one. That seems very interesting. I guess it's about the reptilian dude. Uh, I forget his name. Uh, is it Killer Croc? It's someone else. Yeah, ain't yeah, it? Yeah. That's Killer Croc. Oh. Who was originally okay. created by Jerry Conway, who also created the Punisher. Same guy that created Punisher, created Killer Croc. So, yeah. Awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. I love Garth Ennis. I read Preacher. I'd like to get a hold of those again. Comic books get crazy expensive if you're getting frenzies on there. you got to be careful. And then they got all this variant stuff. Like, I even yeah. fell for that a few times. I need to not fall for that. <laughs> I started looking at it with me because the, um, the signs and stuff, and I wanted all the variants to get a sign. I'm like, oh, my God. How many variants did they make of this book? I can't keep up with this anymore. And some of the variants of Batman 89 are 50, 60 bucks brand new. Yeah, it's crazy. That that Catwoman one was 100. I got the one that's yep. of uh, Michael Keaton. And uh, I I went. I got one, a few of them, but not that one. That's too much. But there was only like two of them for sale on there. So do those usually increase in price really? Like, are those it's a bubble market. They're, right now they're increasing because people get what they call encapsulated in CGC and they get them signed and stuff. And right now the bubble market exists. I don't see it existing long term. What I see existing long term is stuff that's attached to the Marvel movies and is stuff that is attached to other forms of media that are more relevant. For example, yes, maybe right now, a limited print uh, book that might be popular because of a variant cover may be good now, but what will be good in the future is, well, the Guardians of the Galaxy will always be relevant. You know, you get a book like the first appearance of Star-Lord or... Uh, the first appearance of Sword, which was heavily uh, featured in the, uh, uh, the Vision and uh, Scarlet Witch, um, WandaVision uh, show. Stuff like that, I think, over time will hold more for value. Uh, this happened once before in the 90s, and then the whole bubble popped. I don't see why it won't happen again, because um, it's a sustainability issue, and they're making so much, and every single one of them is just so much money right now. 
And uh, I, I've got on that James Tinian kick a little bit. You, I know he just left Batman. Yeah. And, uh, I never read any of those, but there was Nice House by the Lake. I, I came across those. And then Department of Truth, I started getting all those, which uh, seems I haven't read it yet, but it seems like it's right up my alley. There's like a one issue where a dude's hunting Bigfoot and the Bigfoot's on the cover. I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> you know, it's like some. I'm not sure even what's going on in that comic. It looks really weird, but definitely. Looks I like wrote a. Really uh, but I've noticed. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. lag. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, go yeah, ahead. I actually wrote a, a paranormal comic in the uh, '90s. Partly wrote it. Um, we're gonna be bringing it back out again shortly. I'm I'm publishing comics now too. So. Uh, there was a Ooh, book. It's called Exposure. I'll link you to it online. It's a. Uh, it's, okay. it's kind of like a um, sexy take on things. My partner likes to do all the sexy books. And uh, we did a lot of stuff with uh, the people that did chaos and other things in the 90s as well. Uh, but we have one book out. We have three more books about to go out. And, and then one of them does like all the kinds of paranormal stuff, ghosts, aliens, everything. It kind of covers it there. These two female investigators. The book's called Exposure. You can look it up online. It was an image first. and moved around all over the place over the years. That sounds interesting for sure. Another one I saw that I haven't picked up, but uh, may eventually was. I, at first, it didn't look like anything I'd want to read, but those stray dogs. I would see those people were going mm -hmm. selling those like crazy. That, that seems like some kind of like it looks like a Disney cartoon, but I guess it's supposed to be darker or something. I don't know. Yep. But they were going. I'm bringing crazy him into uh, Vegas in November. It's Tone Rodriguez is the uh, artist. Amazingly Ooh. talented guy. From a background, he uh, got mostly known and started with doing the uh, original Marvel uh, Escape from New York comics when they had the Paramount line. He came and went pretty quickly. They were doing Mission Impossible with Rob Liefeld, and then he was doing the uh, Snake Plissken Escape from New York comics, and that's where he kind of got started. Cool. And I saw something about the from the makers of My Little Pony. What was that? <laughs> you know what I was talking about? My Little Pony, that stray dog. Somehow ties in My Little Pony. Like, I guess one of them helped create it. I don't know. I'd have yeah. to look it up. But I saw it. Yeah. Straight. But straight it's, uh, another one with tons of variant covers, too. They, they they have made so many variant covers of those books. I saw one I wanted to get, but I didn't get to it enough. It was an homage to They Live. Yeah, there's, like, horror covers. But there's a trade paperback coming out in September. I'll probably just get that for 16 bucks or something. That's, That's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, they finally read it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some other ones. I've been on the Spawn kick. That's a hard one. I used to have a lot of Spawn, but I had to get rid of them. I was like an idiot a long time ago. So I tried to start getting some more of them. And I have, but that gets crazy expensive. There's some yeah. issues on there that are like $1,000 with that Gunslinger Spawn. And then, yeah, of course, I screwed up. Yeah. I meant to get them, and I didn't. And I'm like, how much? And now, uh, King Spawn that just came out, King Spawn number one, is the number one selling uh, comic book in the last twenty five years. Cool, I got, I have that oh, one for sure. Good, right? Have that one for sure. And then there's the Gunslinger Spawn. They're already starting to sell that on eBay, which I don't think comes out till October. <clears throat> there's another one, Scorch, which is supposed to be like all the spawns on some team or something. That should be weird. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that. McFarlane just kind of been expanding his empire. Uh, he is now essentially almost completely taken over almost all of DC Comics uh, toy licensing. Uh, he just absorbed DC Direct, and he's already doing the stuff that he was doing already for uh, DC on top of that. he's uh, There's another company called Spin Master, but they're not doing as much as him. He's doing uh, all, he's running all the statues, uh, all the action figures, anything that went under the DC Direct banner. He's doing all that stuff now for DC. Todd McFarlane is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Dang. I finally needs to get the movie out. My God, I've heard about it forever. So hopefully yeah. I'm not working on it. Spin Master, what is that? That is uh It's a company that does games and toys. They're really not the best quality, but it's good for kids. It's kind of the stuff that they kind of throw into Walmart. I hope the kids yeah. like. But it's not like the collector pieces like McFarlane. <laughs> Spin Master. Okay, got it. What things out there, comic book wise, that are hot right now? Uh, obviously the Batman eighty nine, and then I forget the number because I didn't know by now. But the, the Superman one as well, the Christopher Reeve Superman, um, King Spawn is huge right now. Um, 
the the Harley Quinn book that's got everybody buzzing because it's got that like uh, scandalous title on there is pretty hot right now. So, like Murder Bang Kill or whatever the heck that's called. Um, on the Marvel side, uh, they're about to kill off Doctor Strange in a, a kind of interesting homage to Daria Argento, where uh, Doctor Strange is going to be replaced by these characters called the Three Mothers. <coughs> Are they really uh, going to keep him dead, though? They don't never, do they ever keep anyone dead? They're never dead in comics. They're never dead in comics. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'll have to check out Superman 89. I, I usually don't like Superman that much, but I like Superman the villain. 70, whatever the year was, I should know. I'm being bad by not knowing it. 77, yeah. 78. 78. So that one, as well as Batman 89, and then the Wonder Woman already came out. And then on top of that, they also had that Wonder Woman crossover comic with a Bionic Woman as well. Oh, wow. And that was pretty neat. Uh, a guy I'm friendly with named Andy Manville, who's been around forever, very heavily associated with his work on Wonder Woman and his association with Linda Carter, uh, he wrote that. And then he had written uh, in the 90s for my friend, who I'm publishing with now, uh, he, that he did Innovation Comics, which was Dark Shadows, Child's Play, Nightmare on Elm Street. They were the ones that originally uh, relaunched Lost in Space before Netflix picked it up and the other uh, movie came out and kind of made it more of an adult. They kind of had an adult kind of version of Lost in Space before anybody else, and then they kind of ran with it. I'll have to check out Superman uh, 88. I'm looking at it. Uh, looks like Brainiac, or I don't know. What's that? Yeah, in the Brainiac's the villain. Brainiac's the villain in this one, and that's a new cinematic Brainiac, and then, of course, Lex Luthor and everybody else that was in the uh, movies is back again as well. Who's the dude with the red dots on his head? On that cover, do you know it's some dude that's like I don't know. He has maybe Martian Manhunter yeah, or something. That's Brainiac. I don't know if that's Brainiac. Brainiac. No, Brainiac. That's, that's Brainiac. <laughs> Brainiac. Brainiac has a dot. Let me look and see. But who's the dude in the back then? The very back with the brain. Let me look into the cover. Okay. This is like a skinny dude that has these three red dots on his head. But then maybe that's like a UFO or something for Brainiac in the back. That's not actually Brainiac. Maybe a craft or something that he drives. And then that's Brainiac. That's Brainiac. The green head? That's yeah. Brainiac. That's What's Brainiac. Thing, that's like a UFO in the back, though? That yeah, Brainiac? that's Brainiac. Yeah, Brainiac has this like, big like, alien uh, face shape. And this one's based on the, the Christopher Reeve one? Yes. Yeah, so they took elements from the comics, a lot of the uh, Kurt Swan... 70s kind of Superman stuff and incorporated it into a more traditional uh, Superman that would, you know, just like they did with Billy D. Williams being Two Faced, being the focal point, uh, they put Brainiac uh, as um, the main villain in this. Another interesting, lesser known fact was before uh, Canon lost uh, the rights to Superman, which they did by bouncing a series of checks, which also cost the Mass of the Universe. And uh, also cost them uh, Marvel, uh, but um, they were going to do a fifth Christopher Reeves movie to follow up uh, Superman Four canon. And my friend Albert Hewn, who did Cyborg in the uh, um, Captain America for 1990, was supposed to do the canon Spider-Man. Uh, was going to direct that as well. So there was supposed to be until he got hurt and the checks all got bounced and stuff. There's supposed to be another Christopher Reeves Superman movie that never got made. I've always heard about the Nicolas Cage Superman Tim Burton one. <laughs> and then there was another one with um oh what's his name uh josh hartnett that was pretty much done then they also cast dj katrona as superman in the justice league movie that got benched they cast everybody weta did all the costumes if you look online megan gale was wonder woman uh army hammer was batman and uh cool. dj katrona was superman uh, the guy that was in Morton Joe in the Mad Max movies was uh, Martian Manhunter. The director was uh, um, the director of the Mad Max films. And um, they cast all the roles and stuff. It was really odd because it was done at the same time as the uh, Christian Bale Batman movies were going on. And they were going to actually have two Batmans at the same time, which would have been a really stupid mistake. Yeah, George and, Miller, is that who does those? Yeah, it was George, George Miller. And it was called yeah, Justice League did, Immortal. Yeah. Justice mm -hmm. League what? Immortal. Okay, okay. I know he did Witches of Eastwick too. I'm familiar with him, but he seems like he takes forever to make a movie like that. Mad He's Max. Now this will be the next uh, Mad Max movie, but it's going to be a prequel, and it's going to be focused on Furiosa, and not Mad Max. 
I'm going to put together the five years. So what was up with the, I don't, did you see the new Masters of the Universe? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, it, it's kind of funny because there's this crazy backlash and some of it, my personal take is there's just people that just ready to just jump because it's like, oh, you did this with my stuff. But if you ever really followed Kevin Smith, it's not a betrayal to kind of what he does. It's, it, it's still, I think personally, very true to kind of Kevin Smith's style. Uh, people's concern over it was that they over, um, they, they over, uh, they, they had a, a significant focus on Tila. People were complaining that it was the Tila show, that it was too much feminism and, and so on and so forth. But majority of people actually enjoyed it tremendously. And it was as and typically this day and age that is a kind of majority, the minority of people that are like, oh, it's, you know, social justice and this and that. Did you see it? I enjoyed it, and I was like, "Why are people so upset?" I didn't get exactly. it. I didn't understand. That was fun. Yeah. My was great. I liked the Skeletor. Um, I enjoyed it. It's going to be a second so season. Amazing. Who's to say there's not going to be, you know, more He-Man in the second season or the next episodes? There's more, right. but they're saying it didn't do that good either. I thought. I thought it said it went off the top ten early or something. So who knows with Netflix? They might ace it. Hopefully not, but you never know with, with any of these places lately. They'll ace something in a minute. Yeah, it was bizarre how bad the backlash was and what it was for. But it's it's you know it's getting like that a lot. And, and I understand you know there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Like they made uh, um, the Supergirl in the DC films is maybe Mexican. I don't know if you saw her. No. So they're doing a lot of that, and and I don't mind. It doesn't affect me, but there's a lot of people that are going nuts over all the stuff that they're doing. They're going to be uh, allegedly they're going to be replacing uh, Henry Cavill with an African American actor, who's going to play an African American version of Clark Kent now as well. So they're doing a lot of that, and it's just uh, sorry about my visitor there. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> they're um. <laughs> There's an African American cool. Batman comic too, right? There's one. Right, the Batman. Really intimating. They'll probably ship that. I wouldn't be surprised if they go towards the comics thing, and then uh, Lucius Fox or his son will be the new Batman to replace Ben Affleck. Which, to be honest, I, if they did that instead of recasting, I wouldn't be 100 percent against it, just because I kind of get sick and tired of the whole recasting thing. Yeah, from a personal sure. standpoint. But I, obviously, they're putting Keaton in the next two, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't have a problem when they do that. I mean, it could be a parallel world, you know, whatever. What's, I don't what doing? It's like, yeah, what's his name? Uh, Pattinson's going to be uh, Earth 2 Batman and so on and so forth. So, I'm looking forward to that Pattinson Batman. That's got some interesting villain situations. Uh, Colin Farrell as a penguin, and I don't know. I know there's some other stuff. They haven't leaked a lot, but some a little bit. I don't know who else is really well, in it. But I know we know it that it's not the uh, Edward Nigma Riddler, which is interesting. Because this is the first time the non Edward Nigma Riddler is going to be in screen. It's a uh, his name something Nash. I forget his full name, but it's not Edward Nigma, which is what Jim Carrey played, and which is what um, the other uh, um, Gorshin played. They both played Edward Nigma. This is not Edward Nigma, and he looks completely different. That's his. Act. That's the Riddler in the trailer with the tape on his face. It's Paul Dano or something like that, or something. Yeah, which is a shame because he's such a um, neat actor to have his face covered up, but I think it'll be interesting. I, I know a lot of people, again, are also being weird about that, but when I realized that was Colin Farrell's the time when I nearly died, I couldn't even tell it was him. Yeah, it looked weird. I mean, it looks good, but it didn't look like Colin Farrell. I saw Paul mm -hmm. Dano in this weird series on Showtime called Escape from Dananera or Damamera or something about this yeah. uh, Patricia Arquette, like, bangs a prison dude and all this crazy stuff. It's a true story, but he was good in it. He's like, I think he was the prison dude that she banged in it, but it's, it's worth the watch. I had Benicio del Toro, uh, Escape at Danamora. That's really good. He was in there with the blood, which I also, I love that movie. Yeah. You're talking about, the, what was he in? There will be blood. That was the one with the, Oh, okay. David okay. okay. I love that movie so much. Yeah, that is a good one. I wouldn't mind seeing that one again. But yeah, that that Escape from Dana Moore is pretty interesting. Benicio del Toro, Patricia Arquette, Paul Dano is like the prisoner that she 
has an affair with or whatever. She cheats on her husband. It's based on a true story. It's pretty oh, crazy. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yes, yes. Absolutely, I remember that. Now. It all takes place in a prison. <laughs> a, a dirty prison. But uh, uh, Paul Dano should do a good job. I don't... I have to. I want to watch that. There will be blood again for sure. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah. Check that out again. Uh, let me think. What else is going on in my head? Uh, I've always been into Jonah Hex. I got a bunch of those. I love those by uh, yeah. Joe R. Lansdale and uh, Timothy Truman. Those are amazing. I love Weird West. That's just a hard mm -hmm. one to find altogether. In a lot of genres, it's hard. It's not the easiest one to find. But uh, and then of course they really screwed the pooch on the movie, which I wasn't yeah. that great. Yeah, the, the Legends of Tomorrow yeah. Jonah Hex is much better than the film movie. Yeah, the comics are really good, especially the Joe R. Lansdale. I've had Joe R. Lansdale on the show before and we talked about all that stuff. But definitely interesting. Uh there was some uh so what's up that James Tinian's leaving DC and just doing his own thing? What is Substack? Have you been there? I'm trying to figure out what the hell it even is. They're I'm all talking make some about videos it. as well. Mike Diodato, I'm also very friendly with. Did a similar move uh, not that long ago where he uh, he went to um oh God I'm gonna forget the name now. It's with the A in it. Now I'm drawing a blank. But a lot of the creators are. It's just there's a bunch of different problems. The biggest one of all though is is that um. Marvel and DC are making these massive, massive movies. They're not paying the people who are creating the stuff that, that are uh, that's going into these films. Uh, Mike Diodato created Iron Patriot. Mike Diodato uh, created Iron Heart, who's going to be the new Iron Man. And uh, they're not get compensation for that. It turned out in a recent article that they're only paying the writers about $5,000 billion dollar movies with the characters they created. Um, so a lot of people in this, I can't say this is why James left, but a lot of people are, Aftershock is the name of the studio, uh, but a lot of people are leaving the big studios because they're developing all this material, they don't own it, and these movies are coming out, they're making billions of dollars, and they're not paying anybody. And it's, it's tremendously frustrating for the creators to have, you know, something that is yours, to see it on screen, to see it realized, see it become a billion dollar movie, and then maybe if you're lucky, you get your name in the credits and a $5,000 check. If you're lucky. Yeah, I saw that article. It's very, very sad. Kind of pathetic, for sure. It doesn't make them look very good, that's for sure. No doubt about it. They look bad. They look real bad after I saw that. Uh, definitely. I'm looking at Aftershock. I'll have to check out some more there. It looks pretty interesting. Uh, Miss Catonic. Uh, huge, huge name artists. And, you know, they want, I, I don't blame them. And they're doing very well in that company. And it's their stuff. They don't have to worry about creating. These are people who are very talented, who created a lot of things that you see in the Marvel and DC movies today. You see their names popping up in the credits. And they just, they weren't getting compensated. It's ridiculous. I'll check it out for sure. One interesting, there's just so many weird comics for everything. I, I don't know if you've ever saw that Jim Henson storyteller where uh, the puppets mm -hmm. and they tell stories, but I found one today, Jim Henson's storyteller, Tricksters, and it's all these trickster, it's a comic, but it's like a four part series and it's trickster stories, like in, I guess in the vein of how they did the show and everything. But one mm -hmm. of them, the, the fourth one is about Loki and Thor and some mask, and it's a whole story about a Norse mythology story. So that was pretty cool. And then of course those Neil Gaiman uh, Norse mythology, I got all those, those are really good. And uh, I started Conan at some point, but kind of forgot about it. I need to jump back in there. Now he's <laughs> an of... Avenger, too. You got Conan is the, the Savage Avengers. So there's all kinds of stuff going on with Conan, which kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you remember when they used to have, uh, back in the 70s, uh, they had the records, and they had the uh, only, way well, you could get it was, it was like a record, one of those like old Peter Pan ones. It was uh, Conan meets Star Trek. But uh, they started doing wow. that stuff began with Marvel. I don't know if you remember the Conan Star Trek crossover. I don't know. That was weird. You can look it up. They have them for sale on eBay. But it, uh, but I thought that having Conan in the Avengers was like, okay, well, that's different. I got that first issue where he's in that Avengers group. I forget the name of it, but I have it. That first one. That was like the first mm -hmm. issue. The Savage Avengers. But, yeah, yeah. I got the first one. So hopefully one day... Like, I've always heard these stories about, like, my friend uh, Daniel, supposedly his dad has, like, a Captain America or something that's worth, like, a, a house or something. Do they really <laughs> get that expensive? 
do they really get that that expensive of, as far as worth? Well, the problem is, is there's only so many, and nobody really knew back in the 30s and 40s that this stuff was going to be worth any money. Now that they have this thing called grading, the CGC, CBCS, where they grade it, it's kind of taking a second life. So you could have a book where maybe beat up, torn to pieces, it might be a $50,000 book. Once you put it in that slab and it's verified, a $50,000 book could be a $250,000, $300,000 book overnight. Because that's where the market is right now. And, I mean, there's people making, like, six figures off some of these books. You know, they're going into their relative's attic or whatever else. And they don't even have to be in great condition. I mean, like, the first appearance of Spider-Man, I, I saw one once where it didn't even have a cover on it. It was still, like, 60000 Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I remember back in the 90s when I was collecting, you know, mostly Marvel, but I was doing some of the DC books. Uh, you know, Wizard had a, in the back of the Wizard magazine, they had a catalog of all the collectible books. And at first edition X-Men, the first book of the X-Men from the 60s was $65,000. So if you had it in like C8 or C9 condition, and they never had listening for C10 because no one ever found them. But you can imagine finding one of those and boom, you get 65000 bucks. Boom. Yeah, but that happens from time to time. People go like a garage sale or something, or they just kind of, mm -hmm. oh, they're going to go up in so and so's attic and they just find the books. And um, they have new technologies where they can restore and improve the condition uh, of the books. They do something called pressing, where they literally it's like putting an iron on the book, and then they increase the value that way and stuff as well. Interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. and well, notebooks well, are going to well, be more and more. Uh, uh, Stop it. <laughs> I, I, it! They're getting it, further and further away from print media, and I think paper media is, is the days of paper media are, are numbered. I think um, just because everybody's just kind of absorbing material digitally, and uh, even the artists and the creators who used to always do pencils are all using Syntec tablets. <clears throat> they're not uh, drawing on pencils or anything like they were before. It's all digital now, almost. But mm -hmm. well, even just memorabilia. Um, one of my Star Trek groups on Facebook, a guy was looking for the George Dickel Star Trek bottle that they used on the on the TV show, and he said, you know, they're like sixty, seventy, a hundred bucks on in eBay. And I said, just go to an antique store; you might find one for nice and cheap. If you find two, buy both of them. And a couple of days later, he got on there and said, I went to an antique store and I found one for eighteen dollars, which was probably yeah. what it was originally for the fifth of whiskey that it was back in the eighties or sixties when they first came out. And he's very, I didn't have the cork, but he, so what? He got the bottle he wanted, so. <laughs> yeah. What is it worth now? They're selling for like anywhere between 65 and 150 bucks on eBay. And it's, it's just, it was a you know, commemorative, weirdly shaped whiskey bottle made by George Dickel back in the 60s. And it has like a little leather harness on it so you can pour it with it. And it had a, an attached like cork. So you could, you could reuse it. Once you poured the whiskey out, you could, you know, pour wine in it or whatever you like. Um, but they used it on Star Trek, and it was it became iconic. And they they've been on eBay for since uh, whenever eBay came out for sixty five to one hundred and fifty bucks, depending on the seller. Did you buy one? I did not. Um, I would actually have look. I've been looking at uh, antique stores. If I find one and it's twenty bucks, that twenty bucks is spent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even care if it has a leather harness. I don't care if the cork is missing, it, it's bought. <laughs> There's another comic I checked out that was getting kind of hot, that Geiger, or is it Geiger? Yeah, I haven't read really that at all about H.R. Geiger, like Geiger, Geiger, not Geiger counter, Geiger. But is that the, the comics about some dude that gets ra radiated or something and like Mad Max kind of stuff or something, mm -hmm. it looks like, it looks interesting. I, I got a few of them, we'll check it out, but. There's another one that I haven't seen yet that everybody's raging about called Something is Killing the Children. Yes. <laughs> that one, is, I've looked through those and I, I want to read them, but there's no way. The prices those are going at are crazy. Like That's insane. why I don't have it. I'm, like, I'm interested to check it out, but not at those prices. <laughs> there is a hardcover book of it coming out in October. Uh, like a, you know, a big one. So I'll check that out. But other than uh, picking up issues for that crazy stuff, it ain't going to happen. That's, that's nuts on there. But that's that James Tinian dude or whatever. He seems to uh, hit gold with a lot of stuff for sure. Everybody loves what he does. Everybody loves what he does. If you want to get something affordable that's coming out in the near future, 
Uh, I love Dan Brereton. I don't know if you're familiar with the Nocturnals and everything he does. They have a Nocturnals hardcover omnibus. It's going to be 30 bucks. It's going to be worth every penny of it. And I love everything that he does. Are you familiar with his work, uh, Dan? No, no, I'm not, but I'll check it out. Everything he does is gorgeous. He did a Batman series called Thrill Killer that was gorgeous, too. But Nocturnals is his kind of like horror comic book, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's just really super well done. And it was like when I saw that it was going to be on Amazon for 30 bucks, I'm like, deal. It's worth every check it out. I'll check it out for sure. I've never, I mean, I've, it sounds familiar, but I've never read it or anything. I may have seen it at some point. I'm checking out some of the covers. Yeah, that looks pretty neat. It looks Halloween-y. Everything looks like a lot yeah. of pumpkins. Oh, yeah. And if you go to Amazon, they have the uh, the hardcover. It'll be free sales of it right now. And it's, again, for 30 bucks, it is worth every penny. I'll check it out for sure. I'm, I'm down. Yeah, there's like a scarecrow looking dude. I don't know what he is. He looks weird. There's a lot of weird dudes. But yeah, I'll check it out. It looks, it looks, looks good. It looks good. It looks interesting. So make a note of that one for sure so I don't forget. It's just nocturnals. Yeah. I was just looking through the covers. But yeah, that looks really good. I'll have to check out some more of his work for sure. Uh, and then uh, let's see. Uh, trying to think. Oh, there's that Keanu Reeves one. Uh, Berserker, Berserker, is it? Mm -hmm. That's also going for crazy money when you start getting involved in the variants and stuff. They had a variant that Keanu signed. It was uh, at retail. It was three thousand dollars to start. I don't even know what is that now. Brand new comic, three thousand dollars with the signature. So I saw some of the newer Morbius, like I think from two thousand something, and it looks signed. Does that make them really go up in value, or is it does it hurt it? Depends when it was signed. If it was signed before the grading system was in place, typically no. Because it's hard to prove, and now everybody wants these specific labels on the slabs, which means that it has to be witnessed. Like I'm helping, I do agent work with some uh, talent and stuff, and I'm organizing a uh, autograph signing right now. And gentlemen's in Brazil where they're stuck because of COVID, they can't get out. So we had to do this whole like rigmarole where we have the company has to have him sign paperwork, and he has to be a witness. And this has to happen, and that has to happen, or they're not going to put the label on there. If they don't put the label on it, the people don't want it. It's a whole thing. So if you can't prove the autograph and it's not in good condition, it doesn't matter. Gotcha. Because, yeah, I was like, it looks, I don't know if I want it signed because it looked kind of like sloppy. And I was like, I don't think I want those. Not that Morbius anyway. Maybe another time. But I know the movie's coming out and stuff. I've always liked that character. But who knows yeah. how that movie's going to be. I didn't understand the Venom movie. It seemed kind of crappy, but it did really well. And everyone like uh, seemed like they liked it. But I was like, Ugh, I don't know yeah, how it's I felt. Yeah, it kind of did that. well in spite of itself. When I first saw it first, I wasn't entirely sure what to make of it. And I didn't think it was going to do well. And then I'm like, oh, well, this is really doing well. And, uh, but they keep pushing back the new one. It just got pushed back another month again. And then Morbius and stuff. I know that's coming out next year, I think. And uh, I've always liked that story. Uh, I know the Midnight Suns. I have all those, but I don't think I have all those Morbius issues. And then there was a newer uh, one that came out. There are some interesting hardcover omnibuses of old Morbius stuff from like all yeah. the old old times I was looking at. Seems pretty interesting uh, for sure. I'm trying to think of some other ones. I know there's other ones. That Department of Truth, have you read that ever? Uh, I, that's another one that's on my list that I haven't. I, I know all about it. That's another one I'm bad at. About. I gotta. It looks pretty interesting for sure. It's like paranormal and some kind of secret organization. It looks really weird for sure. I know I saw the tenth, the tenth the issue, and it was about a dude going to hunt Bigfoot, and there's like a big Bigfoot on the cover screaming. So that definitely down for Bigfoot. I, I came across a Steve Niles Rob Zombie Bigfoot comic. That's kind of yeah. That's, that's a fun book. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that I would was, love to do uh, those kind of comic books. I always get roped into doing the sexy girl book when I write. I've, I've only written so many comics, and <laughs> and now I got this whole label, and it's all sexy. Girl. But the one title is all about the supernatural, so at least I get that. Definitely, I've seen some of those covers, and and you know, like Red Sanja, and there's like a Betty Page comic, there's an Elvira comic, and they definitely sexualize that stuff up it's almost like looking at porn almost <laughs> on some level but uh definitely uh there's some betty page versus some banshee something and there's all kinds of crazy stuff seems like yeah. there's a comic book for everything <laughs> for sure and uh 
I like uh, Hellboy, but I haven't really bought any of those. But I used to read them a long time ago. But actually, that- speaking about Sonya, you know what's neat is um, they had a book where they took Red Sonya and they put her in the future with all of the. Uh, so Dynamite Entertainment uh, took all of the uh, public domain superheroes from the '40s and actually made them their own. And I don't believe they're no. I don't believe they're in public domain anymore. I think they actually own them now. Like the Black Terror and the original Daredevil, not the Marvel Comics Daredevil, but the original. And there's a book out called uh, Red Sonia Superpowers, and it's Red Sonia and all these pulp superheroes together. It's pretty neat. I got that. I haven't read it yet, but I just bought it. <laughs> Sounds interesting. What's it called? Red Red Sonia what? Red Sonia um, powers or superpowers? Superpowers. I'll check it out for sure. Uh, so I mean, heart the graphic novels. Gain in money, they don't really ever. They don't really get, you know, they don't grow and and and, and morph. Not in the last novels. graphic novel is the first version of the story. If it's a reprint, the only time the graphic novels go uh, up in value is when they get out of print. Like if you try to get like right now, if you look up like Punisher graphic novels, for some reason a bunch of them are out of print. Where the fortune, when once they go out of print, you know that's a whole different story. Otherwise, no, they don't hold the value. But the, that's not the purpose of the graphic novel. The purpose of the graphic novels are so that we don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on that because this one's got this cover and that one. We just want to read it. Graphic novels or digital are, are the way to go. I still prefer physical print. I don't like doing digital myself. What are some comics that you have to get every time they come out? Is there some that you're still doing or that, that, are, that you have to get every time it comes out? Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been really guilty of the Ghost Rider, and I just picked up. Um, they have the person from Black Eyed Peas, just did a Native American Ghost Rider comic. Uh, wow. Taboo wrote it. Um, that's I have it. I haven't read it yet. That exists. Uh, there's another Ghost Rider that's like an ancient Ghost Rider that um, with Conan, and he's a flaming spider and stuff. So there's some neat stuff out there. I, I like what they're trying to do with Ghost Rider, and uh, obviously he is coming back to the DC uh, Cinematic Universe as, as the entire Midnight Sun, but it's going to be interesting dynamic because Morbius is controlled by Sony, and uh, Marvel has the full rights back for Blade and uh, Ghost Rider, uh, as well as the Dark Stalkers and the Dark Hole, which uh, they introduced into the proper uh, Marvel Universe in the um, WandaVision, they brought the Dark Hole back interesting as well i like that at like ghost rider native america i'll have to look check that out i, I love native american it's stuff it's written by it taboo it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting to check it out for sure boy we're nerding it up on here that's right well uh jay you got anything you want to get into or ask yeah about? I, I got a couple so uh you talked earlier about how they're you know gender swapping and race swapping some of the superheroes uh and, and i don't i didn't read this article I, I probably should have but i just saw this just a quick blurb the other day that they've announced that robin is now uh, officially bisexual mm-hmm. i don't know if you guys have heard that or read that he, men- he mentioned it earlier slightly yeah yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. like I, I, I don't know why they have it's a comic book it's for kids you know a five-year-old kid who's collecting batman comics doesn't need to know that kind of adult stuff. I know. I'm sorry. When I was a kid, we were collecting comics. They didn't have those kind of. If they had those kind of issues in them, they were so hidden that I was too young to figure it out. But they, they've done that, and they've also. I heard one of the guys at work told me that. Um, uh, I told him about the. They changed Thor from Thor to Thora, and she's been female for a while. And eventually, he's coming back. So I don't know what's going on with that. Maybe you can tell me. Uh, but they took Thor out of the picture and made him female, and made him Thora, and. Allegedly, he's coming back. So this year, maybe he already has. He's, they're getting rid of the, the female Thor character and bringing Thor back as a male. Did you, did you, have you heard anything about that? Jane Foster was Thor, and she's going to be Thor in the movies, which is going to be played by uh, Natalie Portman. So when you see the oh. new Thor movie, it's going to be Natalie Portman's going to be Thor at first, not Thor. Okay. And then, but, yeah. it's it, it The storyline, though, was that he was dying of cancer, and that when she became Thor, she was no longer susceptible to cancer. And only every time that she reverted back to Jane Foster did she start dying again. 
So they're going to do it like the TV show with the, with the Dr. Blake thing where he he said the, the the phrase on the hammer. I don't know if you saw that that couple episodes. Yeah, oh, of, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Hulk, oh, that's the Incredible Hulk. That's what they're going to be doing. That's what it seems like it's going to be, yeah. I didn't well, read that cool. particular version of Thor, but we'll see. Yeah, the uh, the original um, run of, of The Incredible Hulk was one of, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Um, but, you know, they, I think they ruined the character in the movies. They just absolutely destroyed it. Um, but uh, earlier you were speaking about uh, the guy who played in Morton Joe. Um, interesting fact about him. The actor is named Hugh Keys Byrne. He's in the first Mad Max as the toe cutter, the main bad guy. Yep. I don't know if you guys know that. So he's the guy that oh, yeah. uh, he's got like the white hair and uh, Max uh, directs him into the front of an 18 wheeler. And just before he dies, he pulls his goggles off and his eyes bug out and smack. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, George, George, Kennedy, George uh, Kennedy Miller did that movie. Um, Byron Kennedy and George Miller uh, did some great work. But um, what do you know about the the uh, the reboot? Uh, what I understand about the reboot with with the Mad Max Fury Road is that it completely ignores Thunderdome. That it's like it happens like almost immediately after Road Warrior events. Yeah, it, it's kind of like that weird kind of like vague area. Um, obviously, they had the whole issue with Mel when the movie came out, so. Um, they went in that direction where they used um, they used him, but then the weird thing was is there was very uh, uh, noted issues on set where uh, Tom was constantly fighting with Charlie's, and it seemed in both the film and the feedback that it was really kind of in the end less of a Mad Max film and more of a Furiosa film. And now the next film he's doing isn't even going to be Mad Max. We don't know when we're going to even if ever see another Tom Hardy Mad Max movie at all because the next one is going to be a young Furiosa movie. Oh, wow. Not Mad Max in it at all. Well, that, that should be cool. I mean, I, I, like, I like the timeline. I like the, uh, I like the concept. The, the original Mad Max is just a fantastic movie, a, a dystopian future. Um, so I hope they keep that franchise going. Yeah. Um, my, my favorite franchise, and you know, when I was talking books in the 90s, my favorite DC franchise, I should specify, was, has always been Captain Marvel, Shazam, and they rebooted him in the '90s. And they, I have, I think, I, if my, if they're in my comic books boxes, I have at least the first year, maybe the first two years of that reboot. Um, and the movie was okay; it wasn't great, but I, you know, I've come to, I've, I've glommed onto it. I'm starting to like it. But the whole thing with this, and we talked, you talked about it earlier about how Sony has Morbius, and they used to have Spider-Man, and now Spider-Man's back with Marvel, and it. They keep flipping, you know, who is in control of these characters. Why was, and I don't understand, why did Marvel have such an issue with Captain Marvel Shazam, calling him Captain Marvel? It, it, he came out before the Captain Marvel character right. in the Marvel Universe. Um, I know, did, was the, did the rights lapse? I don't understand. It just, it, it kind of pissed me off. It was, back then the rights were different. Even, even through the 90s, my friends who worked on the comic book movies have told me it was all these like weird rights issues. People ran out of money. They sold things. It's just um, because Marvel wasn't always Marvel either. Marvel was timely. And then Marvel went from being timely to being Marvel. So it wasn't always even Marvel comics. And yeah. it was just, I, think, I believe if I remember correctly, what I heard it was more of uh, just a matter of the right people not securing the right uh, um, the licenses until it was too late. But uh, because you have... Um, the Captain Marvel at Marvel, and then you have you know, Captain Marvel Shazam. And then yeah. the other interesting thing was, uh, most people don't know this, do you remember um, a book that was with uh, Alex Ross called Kingdom Come? Ca called what? Now you broke up there. The comic book called Kingdom Come that was drawn by Alex Ross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a true story, and you can actually probably look it up and there's more information about it. The original Kingdom Come storyline was super, super adult, super dark. And when it, it was centered around Shazam. And the original storyline was that Billy Batson was trapped, couldn't grow up, and he was perpetually young for his entire life. And it started making him become perverse and psychotic and evil. And the storyline all centered around that. And then, of course, once DC got wind of what they were trying to do, like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. But it would have been really interesting. It was, it was mm -hmm. basically, for lack of a better explanation, Billy Batson becomes a serial killer. Because he's been yeah. driven mad by being stuck in that body 
over all those years not being able to grow up. Yeah, that would have been interesting. And the other thing about it is, is that it, it isn't actually Captain Marvel Universe. It isn't actually Captain Marvel. It's hyphenated Marvel. Yeah, Marvel. And, and they have an issue with guys, and it, it's it just it kind of it kind of the whole little game in the movie how they they call him different things like Captain Lightning and all these other different things was kind of funny. But I'm hoping that they can resolve that because the Black Adam's coming out I think this year, and then next year they're going to do a, another Shazam movie with Black Adam um, the, with the Rock as Black Adam in it, and I'm looking forward to those. But I hope they kind of they, they get some of that. It was kind of childish kid comedy throughout almost almost can't be like the original batman tv show but not quite mm -hmm. that level not like the bam pam soccer things but um and how do you feel about the costume and the, the, I they changed I was, it. You the new one i haven't seen the new one yet no i, I try to stay away from looking at stuff too much for the movie it's different for the second movie yeah because it, it well, looked like I he was the newer one a little bit better than the one that they had in the movie they did tweak it significantly I, I hope so because I, I felt like he had one of those Nike shoes where you had like the pump and it just it looked like it was just filled with air. You know, <laughs> it's just it's the goofiest. Um, and I don't remember ever the lightning bolt being lit up in the comic when he the newer when one. He the newer one huh? has a hood on as well. Oh, well, the newer ones because I only collected up in the through the nineties, but uh, and remember when he would change, it would you know the lightning bolt would zap across his chest and it would light up for a second. Then it was you know cloth again um but uh i have i don't have the original tv show of shazam on dvd it's available i need to get it yeah i do have the i do have the full season of isis um how do you feel about that show i, I kind of liked it i thought it was a fantastic little kid show yeah. it was neat it would be interesting if they ever use her again they used her briefly in the comics but they've never ever brought her back into media otherwise again yeah, and she was a spinoff of the the Captain the, the Shazam show, and uh, they were both they, they were the same vein as in, and I think they were actually before the Incredible Hulk TV show, but they were the same vein. All three of these shows, it was a road show every day, different city, you know, new new bad guys to encounter, new storylines, and all three shows. Isis, Isis wasn't as good, I don't think, as the Shazam show, and that both of them together weren't as good as um, the. Uh, Incredible Hulk on T on NBC or whatever it was, but they did fantastic jobs. And then throughout the years, they they start to ruin these characters. They, you know, so many of these characters we have. What was that? Five different actors played Batman. We've got three that have played Superman. No, no, sorry, Spider Man. We've there's seven or eight that have played Superman throughout the years. Um, two. You forget three. the seventies Superman before there was there was a Superman in the seventies yep. before Christopher Reeves that was Superman as well. Right, yeah, there's a, there's a yeah, there's a lot of Superman out there, um, but you, you also have we have three British actors playing iconic, iconic American characters. Two Englishmen played Spider Man. One Englishman is playing Superman currently. We don't have an English, we don't have an American playing an English icon like Doctor Who, you know, which would be great, would be fantastic. Um, but do you think that almost they can happened bring with James back? Bond? Came very close to yeah. happening with James Bond multiple times. Yeah, and we were talking about that at work that they don't have an actor, an American actor playing James Bond. There's no American James Bond. Well, there is. His name is Felix Leiter, but he, he's changed characters and actors throughout the years too. Um, but the question I have for you is, do you think they can fix some of those messed up characters? Can they fix the Hulk? The movie Hulks, I think. Ed Norton was no. the best one, but the I think they is, just the it. The problem is Marvel doesn't own the Hulk anymore. Uh, Universal no. owns him. And they can't, no. they can't make another Hulk movie. So right. the Hulk is stuck as a supporting character in other people's movies. And if you've seen the stuff that they're doing on Disney Plus, they're even though it's um, the the actor uh, Ruffalo who's playing him now, he yeah. is one hundred percent playing Edward Norton's um, Hulk. Uh, yeah. Shang Chi, which is coming out next month, uh, features. Um, Abomination, who is going to be returning for another Disney Plus show as well. And it's going to be the Tim Roth as Abomination. The only thing that's going to be changing is that it's not going to be Edward Norton, but it is yeah. it is completely cemented in the continuity of the films that the Hulk of the Marvel Universe is the Edward Norton Hulk played by Mark Ruffalo. And they're not going to change yeah. it, I don't think. 
but that's that's sad because the, the, the Incredible Hulk isn't one of the. I don't think he's one of the best superheroes ever, but um, uh, what's the actor's name who played the TV show? Was fantastic. Lou Ferrigno playing the, the monster, and yeah, Bill Bixby. Thank you, playing the Doctor Banner side. Um, you you don't get much better entertainment than that, and that's from the '80s. And the special effects were pretty close. I mean, there's no digital. It's all raw in the camera kind of stuff. Um, and then you got these all, all the the Hulks now are digital. I mean, it's you can. I, it's just. Immortal, uh, immortal, immortal, immortal Hulk is really good. I've been getting the Omnibus. That's really good. A new Immortal Hulk. Yeah, my Hulk, friend, uh, Hulk. my friend knows that Joe Bennett. I, I'm, I've been I've known Joe for 20 years, maybe a little more. I'm actually doing a private signing for the 50th issue of Immortal Hulk, which is his final issue. Unfortunately, after that, he's off. That. The thing in that uh, one is that the one with the thing. I love the thing too from Fantastic yeah. Four. I get the omnibuses because I'm not going to pay all that for the other stuff, but I have the first two, and I've got to nab the third omnibus for sure of that. It's got horror elements a lot more. You'd love that, Jay. That's a good one. If you ever want to start, get the omnibuses of Immortal Hulk. It's like real horrored out. <laughs> I you, you know, there's a lot of horror in it. It's, it's really good. Oh, but, okay. uh, yeah, it's called Immortal Hulk. You can get the omnibuses for like thirty bucks, and there's probably like I know there's a ton in each issue. I gotta need to get the third one. I'm working on it. I'll get it eventually. There's also director's cuts of the first two issues that you can purchase that are kind of like a um, uh, tweaked versions of the, the first issues. It's kind of nice. Cool. cool. I like cool. when you get on eBay and you find all the issues complete, but usually that can be the price can be pretty scary. <laughs> a lot of stuff when they're all there, you know. Like, what did I get? That DC bag of heads by Joe Hill or something like that. I got that one. It was all issues. It's only like 35 bucks for seven of them. It's complete. I like it when it says complete. Another one, I, yeah. I was hunting uh, Resident Alien. I was hunting all those down. And I can't even find a few of those still. The, the New York one where he's in New York, those are hard to find for some reason. My new project for that has been Shogun Warriors, which I love that line back in the day with the toys. Oh, I love Shogun Warriors. Yeah. I'm <laughs> close to completing the entire run of Shogun Warriors in our close to. Not Do been you have any figures? Do you have any of that Hasbro figures? Ray Dean, Mazinga? Hmm. I, ha I, I have the Super 7 ones. I don't no longer have the original one. When I was a kid, I had the Godzilla. I would love but to have I, the oh, Godzilla. I had the big Ray Dean. My brother had the big um, Mazinga. And um, oddly enough, we found them in Canada. They, they hadn't, I guess they hadn't hit the stores in America yet, but we were on vacation in Niagara. And uh, my dad gave each of us a $20 bill. And this is about, what, 78, 79, or something like that. And we rode our bike from our, uh, we were borrowing my grandfather's uh, RV. And we drove into, I think it was Toronto. We're just having to walk into this, like a everything store, department store. And there are these two giant 14 foot or 14 inch monsters. We're like, 14 bucks? Boom! <laughs> and, uh, I, my brother actually had them at, at his house, and I should have grabbed my Ray Dean back when I, was, when I first found it. He had let his kids play with them when they were growing up, and I think he's probably since thrown them out, but uh, I didn't have all the rockets for Ray Dean, but most of them, and then the little Delta wings that fell out, flew out of it, that, that was one of the coolest toys. You don't find toys like that anymore. They don't make cool-ass toys like that. Yeah, they make toys and other things, but... Ever. Yeah, it's it's sad. The best thing that, that actually was made in, like I guess, up to the '90s, were the Playmate Star Trek um, role play toys, the phasers and communicators and things like that. And I've got a few of those, but they those have actually gone up in price. To be honest, Todd McFarland does good toys. I have a few of those. He does. I Vlad the Impaler and Elizabeth Bathory that horror set. Oh, that uh, line was great. And I love this Clyde Barker line. Uh, what was that? The Immortal Soul or uh, Soul? That was the beautiful line of figures too. All the the, the, the little creepy. Cenobite characters. <laughs> I, I got the I got, I got the Legend one, you know, from the Ridley Scott movie, the big Tim Curry Devil dude. That one, that one's pretty neat. He's got some crazy ones. You start looking through those, you'll get in trouble too, for sure. No doubt about it. But that Vlad the Impaler is really cool. I don't really like the way he's standing though, but I mean, it still looks good. It's just a weird. Like, I guess he's got a stake in his hand or something like that. Uh, I collect weird little Vlad the Impaler uh, dolls. There's one from Sideshow that's really good. It's, it's, what was another one uh, not too long ago? I got uh, the V, you know, the one where the, the show V, 
the, the guy, oh, there's, a, there's a doll the where it's, you take the, 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 the... Oh, I love yeah. that. I wish they would make those again. But yeah, I, I remember those. Those were great. I love V. It looks like Ken, but you take his head off and there's a lizard underneath and the tongue well, moves. As I recall, the original V toys, they had the, the, some of the visitor monster guys, they had the reptilian face underneath and a, a one-time pull-off. You pull the face off one time and there was a, there was a reptilian underneath, but you could, never, you could never put the human face back on. So <laughs> I never got one of those, but uh, I thought to myself, yeah, that's a neat idea, but once you rip it, it's done. <laughs> I have the big one. It's like a like a Ken doll or something. It's a bigger one. But uh, I love that show, V. Funko Pop just put out four Vs. Yeah. Uh, they, have, they look pretty cool, actually. The Mark to... character and the other ones, yeah. I, I, um, I, I would love to have – I've always loved Robert Englund. I would love them to make a new Eddie figure. Awesome. Yeah, that would be cool. I got into those Funko Pops, so I had to calm down. Those things you got to – there's yeah. so many it's things that can – grab a hold of yeah, yeah. it's like very it's like variants <laughs> you're going oh, you have variants though they're, they're funko variants they? oh you got the bloody one or you got this yeah, one that's true or that's this true. one that you can only get at this store that's crazy too i hate when they do that because i had to get the shining ones that are really hard to find <laughs> there's some shining ones there was one uh not too long ago i got this shining uh, board game that came out i haven't played it yep. yet but it looks pretty interesting so you're you you we need to check it out me and christina and uh, it looks creepy it's based <laughs> on the shining actually you want to see something really cool okay there's two things board games one thing board game is based off the john carpenter movie i'm actually remodeling my nerd room and i have this stuff right next to me <laughs> this is the board game that is based off of the actual novel, not the movie. So it is called. Uh, uh, I gotta work this camera here. Okay, this way, Mark. Okay, uh, there we go. Who goes there? <laughs> huh? Which is the? Uh, this is the novel. So, um, and it is not based off of the movie because of that. Um, and it's got like really neat like pieces where you uh, um, and then actual miniatures. Um, where am I hiding my miniatures? But it's it's a really neat kind of intricate. Uh, there we go. So then there are all the different miniature pieces where you have the different characters from the movies. Where am I? There we go. I know there's a book, the thing was based off an old book, and I got it from Kickstarter, but I forget the name of it and who wrote it, but it's like, oh, what's the old book that thing's based off of? There's a book, like an old book, and they, they did it's it called, on Kickstarter. It's, it's, the name of it. it's, uh, it's the name of this game that I just have in front of me that I just forgot already. It's composed it. and that, that's the book that the thing is based off. So what happened was is Mondo got the rights to do the licensed thing movie game, and then these guys got the rights novel and uh so their game is who goes there and then the mondo one is the thing uh which is interesting there's some book though uh, that look, i got it let me see if i can find it book thing was based on and it, I, I, I thought it was it, this i thought it was who goes there well who goes there is uh, the game but i thought the title i may be no, wrong no, I just, this is based off the book and i thought the book was called who goes there this, they oh, got it's called Fro it. It's called Frozen Hell. Oh, okay. Okay, I found it. But the book, the game's based off that, I guess. Frozen Hell, right? Yeah. But there's a okay. But there's a book called Who Goes There the, the, on Amazon by someone else called the thing. I'm confused. Yeah, because that's, that's what not, I thought. The, 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 who goes there? I thought that was the thing. But again, I could be wrong. I'm not always right. Well, My nerd here's pretty good sometimes, but <laughs> but okay, let's we can figure it out. Okay, there's who goes there, the nov novella that formed the basis of the thing, and I, I just found that on Amazon. But then there's this other book, I'm confused. That's called Frozen Hell. What is it? And that they say it's based off a thing, and I remember getting the Kickstarter and everything. Based off the thing, let me look up Frozen Hill and find look, the Arthur. Look, look and see at which what one came out first, and that that would be your origin right there. It's called uh, Frozen Hell by uh, the book that inspired who? Wait, classic John Campbell. Is that the same dude who did Who Goes There? 
Uh, yeah, so maybe it's just the same book and different titles. I'm confused, but yeah, Frozen yeah. Hills on Amazon too, and it's by John Camp W. Campbell Jr. says it's the book that inspired the thing. It's an alternate version of John Campbell's classic novella, Who Goes There? Whatever that means, an alternate version. What does that mean? Weird. Well, I gotta go look at that first. <laughs> I'm yelling. Mm. Yeah. Here's what it, you get: Frozen Hill, John W. Campbell. It's on Amazon, and it even says it's an alternate version of Who Goes There. So, I don't know. Your your guess is as good as mine. I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, they both have to have a publishing date. Whichever has the earliest publishing date, that's the, that's the first one. Well, they're by the same dude, so I mean, I don't know. Doesn't matter. It's one of them came out first. <laughs> he couldn't. He, he couldn't. Well, I guess he could have made written two books and had them published at the same time, but one yeah, of them has a, an earlier a, a publishing date than the other. It is weird. I'm I'm sure Mark can figure figure it out more than I could, but uh, I know I have Frozen Hell. I need to get. Who goes there? I guess, for sure. I'll check it out. But an alternate version, maybe it's something else he wrote that is different somehow, like a, maybe a, a little bit different. And I don't know. But you figure <laughs> it out, Mark. Let me know because I, I don't let you know. I've been okay. kind of fixated on that anyway. I've been wanting to watch it again just because it's 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 a little bit more relevant now because of everything that's going on with Antarctica. You start wondering if it's not unlikely that it could actually become a, a truthful scenario. With everything that they're digging up in that they're that they're not even telling us everything that's going on right now. So it's uh, and Antarctica's yeah. getting super interesting to say the least. For sure, it's been pretty interesting since 1946, uh, which was allegedly the yeah. last battle of World War II. So I mean, they, they claim that they were going there for butter. Yeah, they, they, said they were there to make butter. Uh -huh. Yeah, how, how do you make butter in a frozen wasteland with no cow? Mm. Uh, there's whales. They're making butter with whales, is what they say. Yeah, then butter fat out of whale fat. Yeah, I guess you could do that. That, that makes sense to me. <laughs> that was the official explanation of what they were doing down in Antarctica. But now, all of a sudden, everything else that's going on in the world, and suddenly there's all kinds of activity back in Antarctica again. So I'm like, interesting. And then I remember uh, somebody I know in the film business once told me that um, as quickly as sometimes things like that happen, you start seeing movies coming out. It's kind of a methodology to kind of uh, um, discredit what's happening because people uh, arbitrarily think in their minds if you see it in the movie, it's something from the movie, it can't possibly be real. And that um, it was an interesting com conversation I had one time with a movie producer for several hours. It's really fascinating. But he was explaining to me how um, that uh, uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they kind of get these directives sometimes to make certain kinds of movies. And then you start seeing all of them all at once, where like, you know. Suddenly, you've got like three uh, comments are going to hit the Earth movies. They all just happen, and then the, while that's happening, there's something going on in the news at the same time. We're trying to convince you that there's no comment that's going to hit us. It's interesting. So, I wouldn't be surprised if we start having some Antarctic horror films again. So we, if, if that's true, what he says about Hollywood and uh, how they pick some movies that they shoot and stuff. Well, that's, that's, that's a pig. True. Um, they. Hollywood has been part of the disinformation and disclosure thing. So they, they, they pump out falsehood, sometimes mixed with truth. And then there's a movie that has a lot of truth to it. Then there's a movie that follows that up that has falsehoods to it. Um, the best example I have for that is you probably remember a, a, uh, a Patrick Stewart venue or Patrick Stewart um, movie back in the 80s, uh, Life Force. Oh, yes. Right, Life Force actually Empire bankrupted. Film. And that movie bankrupted Canon Films. That movie yeah. is why the Marvel films actually left uh, canon and they lost all their money. That movie sank the whole studio. Wow. Yeah, it, um, that, that's true too. But um, the origin for that movie is a uh, allegedly Apollo 20 space mission that was top secret that was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, they launched it, Apollos 18, 19, and 20 from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And allegedly, we didn't do them because it was too expensive to go back to the moon. Um, so in Apollo 18, I forget the exact story, but there's a movie called Apollo 18 where they, they fight space monsters on the moon. Yeah. Absolute bunk. Yeah. Um, but uh, Apollo 20 actually allegedly goes to the dark side of the moon where they find a mile-long spacecraft crashed on the, on the moon that they say has been there for millions of years. Uh, and then once inside, the, the three astronauts, and two of the astronauts are American, one was Russian. Again, allegedly. Um, they find two pilots 
one female, one male, with like dreadlock hair, kind of like if you ever seen pictures of the Anunnaki, the statue, of the embossed statues, the, the um, rock carvings of the, of the Anunnaki have like this braided with Rasta type hairdos. They both had that. The male was decapitated either during the crash or in their attempt to, uh, to free him from the apparatus he was ta uh, tied into, uh, he was decapitated. They brought his head back. The female they got out of her apparatus and detected life signs and brought her back to For Florida and alleged she lived and may even still be living. But that whole scenario of Apollo 20 is what became Life Force. And so there's a little bit of truth to the Life Force movie and the, all the Apollo 20 stuff is again, is alleged. We don't have any full evidence that that actually happened, but there's a couple of guys who I trust and they're both dead, Ben Rich and um, um, the grandson of, of um, uh, Bill Lear, John Lear. They both said something to the fact that that actually happened. So. A little the bit person of that I know, the movie also, producer said that this stuff happens all the time, and that people know it, and then they're kind of being told to make this movie, and then they go out mm -hmm. and make the movie. So, yeah, yeah, Hollywood doesn't take a whole lot of stuff that's that's um, original anymore. I mean, they they keep re revamping and rebooting the same garbage over and over again. But there's a few gems out there, like Life Force. I, I hope no one ever reboots that. That's a fantastic movie, and if it if if the Apollo twenty thing is real. Um, that's some fantastic news right there for both, you know, the superhero, supernatural comic book world and for the paranormal real world. Yeah. I did a, um, interview, which is, uh, you, I'm off camera, my friend, uh, when he directed the movie Cyborg and, uh, Cyborg was like the really kind of like one of the final canon films that came out. What had happened was originally... They were supposed to um, do Masters of the Universe 2 and Spider-Man back to back. But because they had lost so much money over Life Force, everything started bouncing check-wise. And they started losing all the licensing rights, which is why today there's all that issue with Sony. And everything is because mm -hmm. uh, between them and Roger Corman, who had also had some Marvel rights, everything kind of went chaotically all over the place. And the whole start of that was because of life force and a uh, cannon bouncing checks yeah. but um and it was because of that movie yeah menachem and yoram globus those were the guys that ran cannon yep. yep yeah yeah they had some pretty good stuff that's some good stuff in the 80s um there's three of those friends movies. Knows, the movies he did were cannon movies he did a lot yeah. of movies from Canon. yeah they they they, they actually I, I there's probably at least in my collection, and I haven't unboxed my DVDs. I just moved up to Pennsylvania. Um, I, I haven't unboxed my DVDs yet, but I've probably got, I'd, I'd say at least six or seven, um, maybe even a dozen canon movies. I love their stuff. They had really good stuff back then. Oh, yeah. They had fun stuff like the American Ninja movies and then yeah. all the early Van Damme stuff. So, yeah, a lot of different things. A lot of different they did the American Ninja, the they, 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 did the, uh, they did the Enter the Ninja. I, I don't know that they did. The American Ninja with the American actor. I know they did the Shokasugi movies. Yes, they did the Shokasugi movies. They did Black Eagle with Van Damme. I think it was theirs too. Mm -hmm. um, they did Breaking. The, and the Breaking American Ninja movies. series was canon as well. The four American Ninja movies with Dudikoff. This, this this is really you'll like this, Jeff. This is really going to geek me out. Um, they did Breaking and Breaking Two, which I saw in the theaters, um, and mainly because I was a break dancer back in the eighties. So. Oh, I wow. had to, and and the great thing about Breaking, I don't remember about Breaking Two, but Breaking is actually narrated by uh, or uh, Ice T does a lot of stuff in it. The the rapper Ice T. So <laughs> what movie is it? <laughs> Breaking. Breaking R e a k i n apostrophe. I was gonna buy like breakdancing. Um, yeah, it's about breakdancing. Yeah, like break yeah, and the, the girl who's in it is actually one of the major movies. I'm sorry. I was gonna buy those breaking toys because I was a huge fan of the movie, and then I was on a forum, and Babu Shrimp was like, "They didn't pass for these figures." I'm like, "Okay, well then I won't buy them." And then the figures kind of disappeared because I didn't know they had figures for it. I just watched the movie because I wanted to steal breaking movies. Recently, <laughs> they recently like a, one of those nostalgia outfits went ahead and made breaking figures. Was, oh wow. uh, They had um, they just had three of them. They had uh, they had Boogaloo and I 
Oh God, who was the other two that they put? They, they only made Turbo. three of them. Turbo, Turbo yeah. Was Turbo. Was, it was Turbo and Boogaloo, and then I forgot the third one was they made. They only made three of them. Did they make one of the girl because she was pretty hot. She, no, she was like, no, they did not make one of her. It was another one of the guys, and I, I'm drawing a blank as to which one it was. But it was definitely it was Turbo and was it Boogaloo or was a Turbo. One of the two of them. I was at a forum and something. They're like, "Don't buy these." They didn't pay us. I'm like, "Oh crap, I want these." But now that I know they're not paying them, I'm not going to just buy them. I'm going to look for this. I, I, I don't, I don't break this anymore. I, I still can, but uh, oh, Turbo was can. awesome. That that dude could uh, he the things he did. I actually stole a move uh, that he did with the broom. I did the dance that he did with the broom. Like my, my oh the, yeah, the broom. He had, I actually had a breakdance crew, and uh, we used to hang out in front of the movie theater on Rockville Pike. And there's like the the movie theater was here, and then right next door was like a shoe store. They had like a an inset door, so all the breakdancers would hang out in there. We'd throw down cardboard, and we, we had poppers and lockers and, and breakers and everything. And I actually did the broom dance there one time, where he steps on it and the broom goes. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> wow. What is up with who's go goes there? It's hard to get and it's expensive. Is that hard? I mean, is there somewhere secret I can go? I don't think but it's expensive. It's like 200 bucks. <laughs> and hard to find. Is that what you paid for yours? Um, uh, I think it's 100 bucks for mine. How much? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's at Target for sixteen bucks. No, there That's it is. Hard. No, here you go. It's on Amazon for sixteen bucks. Who goes there? The novella that formed the basis of um, it's on. It's sixteen bucks. You got to find the newer edition. No, I'm talking about the game, the board game. Oh, the game. No, the, the game's out of print. The game was like uh, seventy five yeah. bucks, but I don't think it's in print anymore. Yeah, like I said, it's out. It's out of print. It's just, games don't last in print as long as books do, unfortunately. So. Uh, when, when when I moved here, one of the stipulations for my brother to help us get the old house sold was uh, he was going to make us throw away a bunch of stuff. Oh, God. Yeah, it's and like he threw away for me about a thousand bucks worth of games. So, yeah, and yeah games are not crazy. games are hard to collect. Yeah, I paid close to two hundred bucks. I mean, a hundred bucks. I mean, rather, I'm sorry, but, but yeah, it looks like it's close to two hundred now. This, the other thing game that came out was um, that's out of print as well. The Mondo one's like three hundred dollars because you can't get that either. I see it on Kickstarter, but it says pre-order, but the uh, the button don't work, so it must not. Yeah, be, oh, I heard they're releasing it. It's got the expansion. It's 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 not the money for just the one. If you get the extra one too, they do that all the time. They're gonna remake another cop a release of it. Mm -hmm. or a third edition, a third edition. Yeah, that's small. Or a second edition, however many editions they made. Yeah. Yeah, the second edition so I, is uh, two hundred dollars at least. Yeah. I have to keep an eye out, but yeah, everywhere I see I it's whole, like two hundred. Board games over here. I got to put out, and then I got my collectibles. I'm really excited for this. I don't know if you've seen these before. Uh, I got this from Full Moon. This is the Laser Blast action figure. Oh, cool! I've, I have that movie. It's weird. <laughs> I love it. It's just a bad movie, but I just enjoy it. I have a, uh, well, I do have a full moon figure. It's the dude from Subspecies. I have him, oh, Red Dude. Right. Red Ooh, dude. Which one is it? It's the, the main dude. The main dude. Yep. It's Radu, right? Yeah, I have him. One of them's Radu, glow in the dark Radu, from Radu. Japan. One of them's glow in the dark and from Japan or something weird. So, uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I have a Vlad the Impaler Sideshow doll. It's pretty cool. I love that one. Uh, there are some Sideshow Vlad the Impaler sculptures that are crazy. I'll never own those. They're like thousands and thousands of dollars. But I do have a cool Sideshow Vlad the Impaler that comes with a cup and all this stuff. It's really cool. But no, There's some I Jerry Oldman uh, ones that are in uh, Japan that aren't 100% official that are gorgeous as well. What? Oh, Gary Oldman ones? Yeah, there's there's one the company that makes one which is in the the red battle armor, and another one that's got them in the, like the um the Victorian suit with the top hat, but it's not officially licensed. I'll dig it up and I'll show you the picture. They're beautiful pieces, but they're not licensed. But they're they're like a lot of things that they do in Japan. They just kind of make it. Yeah, like the Kote Bukaya kind of stuff. Yeah. 
I'll have to check it out. They did some Funko Pops of that movie, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. They're pretty mm-hmm. cool, for sure. I'll have to. I looked up uh, the uh, Japanese Gary Oldman figure, Dracula. See what see what comes up. There's all kinds of weird stuff like that. There's one. Dead the, Man the, Toys the, is the one company. That, that the older version of Dracula. If you look it up, it's Red Man Toys, uh, Dracula. Ooh. That's the old man version of him. I'm looking That's at one, one of them, and there's other ones, though. I have to look. Yeah, if you find anything on that, let me know. I'd like to check those out. I've never seen them on eBay. I know Todd McFarlane did some uh, Bram Stoker Dracula figures of the werewolf and the bat creature. Those are, like, hard to find, really hard to find. Yes. I actually have those, but those are, like, rare, very rare to find. They're cool, for sure, for sure, for sure. Now, I would like to get that who goes there, but I didn't think it would be that much. My gosh. There's one, like, yeah, for I, sale. I, think, I think I paid 100 bucks for mine. It's crazy. It's crazy how that works. There's one on eBay that's signed for 200 or something. That's the cheapest one on there. Mm-hmm. And then it's a sign. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so why do you got to put your butt on camera? Man? Your butt. <laughs> so aren't you big, big time into Flash Gordon? I, Flash Gordon. Love Flash Gordon. I have, oh, did I, I have this massive collection of Flash Gordon stuff. I'm considered one of the largest collectors. I have the foil uh, poster. But that signed, uh, that signed. I've got one sheets. I've got. Um, let me get over here. This room's a little bit of a mess right now. So if you see any of the mess, I apologize. But I've got stuff everywhere that's all like autographed. Like even the Robocop behind me signed by him. And then uh, uh, I'm not giving you treats. That's not why I'm getting up. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, my Kitty favorite time. piece. My favorite piece from the um, Flash Gordon personal Flash Gordon collection is going to be. Now, well, let's see if I can get it up. Is that? I don't know. Oh no! Yeah. 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 yeah, I got a. Um, come on, Mark, with the camera. I'm so bad with. There we go. So yeah, that's like that's one of my cherished pieces right there. Was it? Was that shirt worn on the show on the movie? No, God, no, I wish. <laughs> but uh, I'm so happy nonetheless, and I have a lot of like. Hard to find uh, posters. There was a super, super limited edition uh, Flash Gordon. Um, it was a, a, a foil mile hour poster that was uh, released in theaters before everything else came out. And they did a lot of those mile hour foil ones. Star Wars ones are worth like three, 4000 a piece, even if they're beat up. The problem with these posters are is the mile hour gets damaged very super easily. Mm. So it's not only hard to find these posters, but it's also hard to find them in decent condition. Because most yeah. of them are in just horribly damaged condition. What happened with me was I got lucky. There was some old dude who had uh, finally retired after having a movie theater in some small town for like 50, 60 years. And he found the Flash Gordon poster in perfect condition. I paid him $500. I got it signed by Sam Jones. Sam signs everything for me. And that poster is worth about seven or 8000 I think, right now in the, in the condition that it's in with the signature because there's probably less than 200 of them in existence in the wild and good condition inside. Wow. wow. Cool. Uh, Isn't Takiti with Kahiti? I always mess up his name doing something with Flash Gordon, I heard or read. It's the, the, New Zealand dude, the New Zealand dude. Yeah, the Thor guy. Yeah, I have this too. I have a lot of different uh, Flash memorabilia. This is the old uh, Gold Key comic signed by him as well. Say his Forgot name, Takiti Wikiti. Uh, Ka- say it right. Ka- 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 I think is the way you say it. <laughs> I like him. He's got a new show on Hulu, Reservation Dogs, he helps with. It's about these native kids that are on a reservation. Yeah. It's really good. I liked it. And I like what we do in the shadows and all the Thor stuff, but hopefully he's going to do Flash Gordon, but I don't know if they're doing a series. Oh, you something else cool. Did you know they make a Flash Gordon role-playing game? There's also going to be an 80s retro board game coming out, but, oh, don't yell at me, Pat. I'm not giving you treats yet. Uh, this... It's a beautiful, beautiful game. This is uh, not so easy to come by. I'm actually, I'm opening my store again, and I'm going to do what I can. I talked to the publisher to get as many copies of this as possible. People just don't know about it. This is the Flash Gordon role-playing game. Oh, wow. And it's in this cool. giant, massive box. Just got all this stuff. And um, 
it's it's a combination of the original Flash Gordon and then the, the movies is kind of like a little bit. They've got like um, they use cards with all the different characters and stuff in them. Um, and then you have the books, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Custom Flash Gordon dice, uh, special limited edition books. So uh, the company that makes it is so you have the combat map is the actual uh, rocket ship Ajax. Um, they got the different maps, and then um, El Mean, or Flash, and then uh, all these different things, archetypes. It's a, it's a really, I love this. It's a, it's a great uh, it's a great role-playing game, and not many people even know it exists. Not easy to come by. But, uh, you they you have a uh, one six scale time. Did you open it, right? Of course. I I, I don't open everything, but that I open. Like I have all the auto the action figures autographs and those I uh I keep. Um they have like this little poker chip type things. It's an interesting game. I like it. Sounds like it. Yeah. So you still got a a, a a lot of pinball machines? Um I'm switching over to a digital pinball format. I'm gonna have a sponsor with my store. And the sponsor is, um, they make these things called digital pinballs. So what it is, is you get a pinball, you skin it how you want. You're one of these guys out there that, these companies that make the uh, things. So I can make like a Flash Gordon pinball, and then in it, I can put like 5,000 pinballs inside it. And I just switch which pinball game I want to play. And they sell these for about 700 bucks a machine. They're beautiful. And I'm starting to get into that instead. And then all the uh, the retro arcades, uh, like Star Wars, Ninja Turtles. And then I'm starting to build stuff. And the events that I'm doing are gonna, and the story that I'm about to develop are going to be utilizing these new uh, digital recreations, which are a lot less money than the uh, originals. And at the end of the day, as long as I can play the game, I'm just happy. So. Cool. Do you play it by yourself or play it with other people? You can People come you in here. Play and it with other people. Yeah, absolutely, they play. I'm actually in the process, which is why it's a mess right now. I'm converting the uh, what would have been the family room in my apartment into an actual full blown uh, arcade. Is this the kind of stupid Ooh. things you can do when you're my age and you're single? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I want to geek out on you. There was a, there was a, um, a pinball game. Uh, back in the 90s, mid to late 90s, that my friends and I played when we were in college, and we, we were drunk and high on chemicals and whatnot, called Earthshaker. And what happened was, there was I can't remember what it, what happened, what, what made this thing happen. Either you hit a certain target or you hit a certain score, and the machine had this thing in it that would, the whole thing would shake, and it would shake the ground, you could feel the ground shake. And it was awesome as hell. And we, we were so drunk when we played it, I don't remember exactly what started it, but you hit the special target, or you hit a certain score level in the special tar target, and then it would shake the floor. <laughs> you ever heard of that Earth Shaker? I don't know if I've seen that one. I've seen a lot of them, but I don't recall that one. They don't have it in there because they went to. Physical, yeah, it's a physical that, pinball game with a regular big old silver ball in it. It was the funnest game ever. I like the combination of the licensed ones, and then I like ones like Black Knight. Like I love all the Black Knight balls. That was one of my favorites. And now there's a company out that does these incredible limited edition uh, horror themed uh, pinball. And they just did a Halloween pinball. The pinballs are so popular that even though they're like 9,000 a machine, they sell out in under 10 minutes. The, pin, the yeah. Halloween pinball, the, um, the, the lever uh, is an actual knife handle. So you pull on the knife handle for the ball. And it's got like the <laughs> Halloween music and everything and it's all original. That thing, I've never seen something sell out so fast. They have a Rob Zombie one, they have a Monsters one. It's a company that's kind of new that's competing against Stern and all the other companies. But uh, the regular pinballs are still alive and well. But um, budget-wise, definitely um, I'm going towards the digital just because it allows me to have a huge volume of uh, pinballs with the limited space that I have. One, one machine, many games, basically. Yeah, because it's all emulated. So, I mean, on one machine, I can have a thousand or however many pinballs exist. So, what we've done is I've talked to the company that makes the digital pinballs. I'm going to have an account. I'm going to put three or four in the store, and then I'm going to put another three or four because I have self control issues in the apartment. How I'm squeezing it all in, we'll figure it out. Because I also, uh, 
I can't help myself, and somebody broke up with their uh, girlfriend, and she severely damaged his original Neo Geo arcade. He gave me the whole arcade cabinet for hundred dollars. The arcade cabinet is a three thousand dollar machine. He just didn't know how to fix it. She cut all the cables in it. Oh man, that's rough. That's, that's very tough. <laughs> for sure, definitely. Uh, what what pinball machine was it? What kind? It was the arcade. It was a Neo Geo uh, what called MBS, the uh, four slot MBS. Cool, cool. And uh, a, a runaway pig. Cool. How do you fit all that stuff in there? It's not gonna. The floor's not gonna fall. Is <laughs> I was just supposed to come through. There's literally like fairly soon there will not be an inch. I'm in a one bedroom apartment, and I've got about ten machines in here right now. <laughs> Ten pinball machines in a one bedroom. My electric bill apartment. is not funny. It is not funny. But I love it anyways. You keep them running all at once. You keep them running all at once. If I have the ones that do. I do like the whole fizzle thing. I've been I've been adding and adding and adding and adding stuff though. So my next thing I'm going to do is, is I'm going to get a vintage style uh, arcade carpet, put it in, and then put up the black lights. So. Cool. For sure. So what, uh, I have a runaway pig in the house. No worries. I got a runaway cat in front of me right now. A mini pig. Uh, they're, 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 fun, they're fun at first. <laughs> yeah. Until they start squealing. <laughs> yeah, until they rawr, rawr. But definitely. So what kind of conventions you got coming up? Uh, I'm doing an event now called uh, Mortal Con, which is going to be where I'm bringing in uh, ten people from Mortal Kombat and the uh, star of the third Leatherface movie. Hold on a second. I have a cat about to destroy all my and destroy. Hold on. Uh -oh. My cat just did about like five hundred dollars in damage to my apartment. Hold on. I'm okay though. Uh, so I have the Mortal Kombat event that's taking place in um, September. It's called Mortal Con. We're actually in the process of booking all the future ones as well. Oh my God! I'm gonna kill this cat. <clears throat> what does it, it do in books? It's my comic stash. And it's my expensive comics. I'm pretty sure he bent a few in the process. Uh, let me just grab that. All right, no problem. This is no the Red problem. Sonya book I was telling you about. I'm sorry. We're good. Uh, it's okay. The Red Sonya book. Superpowers. Right. You better cut it out, cat. It's going to be deep Oh, my track. God. He's just like on a wrecking ball today. All right. <laughs> Wrecking Ball, Mortal Kombat. I saw the HBO. It was on HBO Max, the movie. It was pretty good, the new one. Yeah, so I got the uh, seven of the original guys that were from the video game that um, th that were the stars of the video game, and I got them to come. And then since uh, Leatherface was a downloadable character from the uh, game, I brought Ari Mihailov, who played Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And... Um, I have Carrie Tagawa and the gentleman who plays Joker in the Mortal Kombat games uh, in a show in November. Uh, in October, I'm bringing in Michael Keaton's Batman stunt double to do a big signing. And then he and Billy D. Williams are going to sign the Batman 89 comics. I have these two wrestlers who uh, impersonate uh, Macho Man and Hulk Hogan. And the one guy actually got a gimmick and he wrestled in WCW in the 90s was Randy Hogan, which is not his real name, of course. And they look just like him, which is the funniest part. It's like a whole gimmick. <laughs> so uh, I got them coming in, and I've got two slasher actors I'm trying to book. And then in November, I have a uh, Kiss comic book convention in Kiss Mini Golf with a bunch of people who worked in the Kiss comics, including uh, the gentleman who did the Stray Dogs book. He did a couple Kiss comics, including the Treehouse of Horror Simpsons uh, Kiss comic. Oh, cool. And then uh, November, we have uh, the Midwest Gaming Classic, and then possibly January... I'm doing another Mortal Kombat event in Arizona. Cool. So what what is the what is it that you're tying into Mortal Kombat? A, a, a comic? We're doing events. So every event we bring in the Mortal Kombat guests, and then usually some people from other games too. And then uh, they do celebrity signings, video game tournaments. So with the one in uh, September, we're going to give away one of those replica arcade machines as the main prize signed by everybody. So you're going to go home with an um, at-home uh, Mortal Kombat arcade signed by all seven of the guys that I'm bringing from Mortal Kombat. Do you ever work so, with NetherRealm, the one that makes the newer games? No. They've made I'm them all. I'm trying to talk to uh, Warners directly, but no. 
Uh, there's some weird history between them, and I wanted to go to another realm. They asked me not to. I'm like, oh, huh. I don't get sued. I don't care if I go to them or not. I said, I would rather go and talk to Ed. And they're like, just deal with us. I'm like, okay, uh, for now, but we'll see in the future. I may go to another realm anyways. Uh, I've always wanted them to do a, a horror one, a horror like like Infinity uh, or whatever that one, Injustice, but uh, horror characters. You know what I mean? There is like an official one that's on the internet, actually. It's got Jason. I've Freddy seen it. I've seen it for sure. Yeah, I would like to see it officially, but I like that they have Jason and they have Leatherface and they have the aliens and all those characters in the Mortal Kombat already, which is why I kind of wanted to incorporate that with this, and I brought Ari in because it's a lot of fun as well. Um, and he's they're going to be doing actual photo ops and costumes. You could literally have Leatherface with the Mortal Kombat guys together, which is kind of neat. That'd be cool. Yeah, I played those Mortal Kombat's. They're good and got those extras. I think Bruce Campbell's in one now. I don't think I got that one. I'd have to double check. I think it's Evil Dead or something. I'd have to look. But uh, so, uh, what else is going on? Tell us some UFO secrets. We got about eight, about twelve minutes or so. Sure. Sure. Any new UFO secrets? I've been just kind of uh, <laughs> observing and stuff lately. All the stuff that's been going on more than anything else. I haven't talked to anybody specifically lately or anything, but uh, I, I, I've been trying to myself obviously there's been a lot more reports there's been a lot of more stuff coming out and what i like to do is i like to look into the science of it. i like to try to find out how is this scientifically possible and stuff and i don't know if you've noticed but all of the new reports all the new stuff has everything coming out of the water did you notice that yes yeah. uh usos yeah that's what they call them anyway but still ufo yeah, but uh, I, I find it really interesting, and I've been like reading a lot into that, and trying to figure out, okay, so if they're coming out of the water, is there some sort of like a stargate in the water, or there, there's something significantly happening that's coming out of the ocean that they're not entirely telling? Because even though they tell us stuff, they don't tell us everything, of course, ever. But um, having researched and studied and talked to people in the past, it's always that one detail that people either overlook or don't uh, – focus on enough and in this case i think it's the water and something that's going on with the ocean and that's i've been completely fascinated by that i don't know about you or not uh but i just i want to know more of what's going on in the damn ocean because clearly everything says they're coming out of the ocean i know there's a new ufo series on showtime and that jj abrams produces or something i haven't seen it yet but there's been some new new documentaries that i want to check out on Netflix, yeah, I want to watch showtime Showtime has one too now with J.J. Abrams as a producer or something. Looks pretty interesting. I'll have to check it out for sure. But yeah, I it's wonder just, about J.J. Abrams is doing it though. I don't know, but yeah, yeah a lot of people, people worry about. You doing it from a fictional viewpoint or non-fictional viewpoint? You know, it's non-fiction. It's like a documentary, but he's just a producer. I don't know, but. Uh, I know it's fun watching those news anchor people freak out about it, especially on Fox. I, I look look up Fox UFOs on YouTube and look at all those jerkwads talking about it. It's beautiful. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Allegedly, and I haven't had a chance to, to zero in on this, but allegedly, I was one of those little news blurbs came up. You know, when I open up my browser and my phone, it gives you like so many like little news stories to look at. And allegedly, again, I haven't verified it. NBC News caught a UFO on one of their live uh, news reports. Have you guys heard about that? Uh-uh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I haven't looked into it any further, but it just, that sounds interesting that you're doing a live video and boom, here comes a UFO across the across the image. <laughs> Well, I had those uh, Michelle Disrochers, and she's been on a lot of paranormal shows. We had weird stuff happen around here, and these mediums, and they're they're very intelligent. I'm not doubting any of it, but it was a lot what they told me. Basically, they're greys that have been coming here and getting uh, someone's someone's mother who lives here. <laughs> so, but I've had UFO stuff all my life, and I've seen some weird beings. Chill out. What are you barking at? Thunder. But anyway, the, I thing, that's, to the thing that's interesting is, is from a scientific standpoint, if these are smaller craft, they either have to get here through a larger craft because there's no way that would be fueled. Even if there was some kind of other technology we didn't know about, if, there wouldn't be enough space for the type of nuclear reactor-sized power plant that we need to 
bend space and time to get something that small across space like that. So then there has to, in theory, there should be something like a portal. And that's why I've been kind of fixated on the water. And is there a portal somewhere in the ocean that they're all coming out of? And is that well, how we're getting here? People are saying there's a, there's a Stargate inside our sun. Um, and there's a compelling video of, of a UF, UFO, UAP coming out of the sun. Um, I've seen that. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a, a device inside the sun like a star, like this, the TV show Stargate. Uh, I don't. When I, I see Stargate, really, I mean that kind of a device, not like the TV right. Show. Yeah, I, I don't really follow that. Um, I, I, I'm like with you. I follow the science, and, and according to Bob Lazar, um, you know, U, uh, UUP uh, Unum Pentium Element One Fifteen. I remember when I was in high school, the elements had that little blow up that came off the elements that were natural elements. And there were two boxes that were man-made elements and one were ones that we had verified, like, you know, the nuclear material and polonium or what have you. And the other one was like the stuff that we had made, like the heavier elements, you know, like elements 103 to 125 or something like that. But I remember seeing UUP and element 115 back in the 80s. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, Bob Lazar came out and started talking about Element 115, and he didn't call it Union Pentium then. He didn't say anything about that. He just called it Element 115, and that it was like a little chip, like you know, shaped like a Dorito, but like a coin size thing. Um, that was this was the power for the power plant for the UFO he saw, and according to his research, that device had three little bells or things underneath. The uh, main level that were the the gravity generators, or what he called them gravity amplifiers, which would allow this particular small scout ship to travel vast distances from one star system to the next, and maybe even from one galaxy to the next. I don't know. We don't know how much how long this, these little chips had, how long they would they would last. But original theories were back in the you know fifties and forties where they they actually have videos of like the cigar craft. Of, smaller craft launching off of it and then sometimes redocking with it so i am with you it's either gonna it's got to be either or it, it can't be both it, either the ships have enough power no matter what size they are to go from here to alpha centauri and back on one fuel cell or they're docking with a larger device that has enough power to go from this galaxy to the next and the next and drop off stuff as they go along don't know for sure yeah. but it's got to be something it's got one of those two has to be true Right, right, right. And there's no question that they're here because they are. And, and, and that's that's why I've been fascinated with the water thing, because if that's a point of origination, then that could mm -hmm. be a portal. Otherwise, how the heck are they getting in the ocean? Because they're not coming from the air to the ocean. They're coming from the ocean up into the air, which is also interesting. Yeah, and, and I've actually had arguments with uh, with um, uh, Georgia Sukulos over this. Um, there, there's a there's a, an ancient, ancient, ancient prehistoric Japanese figure called... Um, uh, oh God, they're the Dogu figures. They look like look like spacemen. I don't think they're spacemen because the Dogu story is that these these figurines came out of the water, again like the UFOs, and it was a multi atmospheric suit. So what my theory is that these creatures can breathe our e our air. And that either they breathe water, or they have these devices that they wear that they can go from water to an atmosphere and then to a non atmosphere like space. And I think the same thing is true of their craft, that it's not an atmospheric craft. It's a multi-atmospheric craft. So their, their spacecraft can go from outer space to inner space, into water, out of water, into lava, out of lava, maybe pass through an entire star without being destroyed or damaged in any way. Um, that, I think, is more more plausible. Uh, some of the some of the researchers are so adamant that it's one thing or the other. There's no in between, mm. and these Dogu figures and the, the spacecraft that we've observed them coming out of water, we've seen them go into volcanoes. I haven't seen any videos of them coming back out. Um, we've seen videos of them coming out of the sun. Yeah, they're multi atmospheric. They can go in and out without taking damage. So either they have specialized shielding or devices that keep them from being damaged in outer space, in water, in air, in suns, in other places has to be true. They've seen the video footage. It can't yeah. can't not be true. <laughs> Definitely fascinating. It, it is. And and I'm glad you said that they're here. And I, I've been saying that since I was a kid. Some of these people are so adamant that aliens don't exist. 
it's mathematically, I mean, even if you're not a math person, and I'm not, my father was a math person. He taught my algebra teacher math. So when I went to high school, I was taught math by a lady who was taught math by my dad in college, which sucked because I sucked at math. I still, I'm, I'm good at the earth sciences. I, I excelled in, in like geology and, and, and meteorology and in earth sciences and what have you. But the mathematical sciences just, I'm dyslexic. They just elude me. But mathematically speaking, it is mathematically impossible for this to be the only planet in this hundred trillion solar system galaxy. And if you expand that to the hundreds of trillions of galaxies, which also have hundreds of trillions of stars in them, which have hundreds and hundreds of trillions of planets around them, it is impossible that there are It just needs that one combination for, for life to be sustained. And yeah. if, if from the simple number, from the simple uh, statistic standpoint, we can't be the only planet in existence right now that has the correct distance from a star to sustain life. Mm -hmm. The ability to have water. It's just like you said. It's mathematically it's impossible that that doesn't exist elsewhere. It's just it's, it it's can't not happen. You can't. You can't. Be, it cannot be that this is even if if you, if you, if you do the math and then there's what the, uh, the that guy who did that uh, the the life equation thing, the Drake equation. Um, mm -hmm. If you take our galaxy as an example, we have one planet that we know that has life. And if you average that, and we don't know how many planets are in this galaxy, we don't know how many stars are in this galaxy, but it's somewhere around 100 trillion. You take 100 trillion stars, and let's say they have, we have, we had nine, now we have eight planets. Let's say on average there's five planets per star. You've got 500 trillion trillion planets times one averaged out. There's trillions of planets in this, in this galaxy alone that are filled with life. Life is everywhere, it's teeming. And I, and I guarantee you, it, it will probably never even happen in our lifetime. But I will bet you dimes to dollars. I'll bet you ten dimes to ten dollars. You get you get ten dollars if I lose. I get ten dimes if I win. That there's life in outer space. Like you ever see the Star Trek episode? Um, oh God, I don't remember the title of it. But it has the space monster in it that's about to kill itself by a, a, a supernova, and the Betazoid guy gets on the plant on the ship with uh, his friend uh, Troy, and he gets on this this creature this is a spaceship tin man is the is the episode star trek next generation tin man there's a creature that's designed like it, it it's got an interior like a spaceship but it's a living creature that lives in space i guarantee you that's true i, can, I, I haven't i have no proof it's just a theory but it's got to be true we have hey guys we gotta we gotta end this this booger you, <laughs> it's been it's been great mark you got any links you want to put out any links? Yeah, I'll send you the stuff for the Dracula stuff. I'll look it up a little bit later, and I'll send you, okay? Okay. Uh, is there any other links you want to share, though? For the links or website oh, for links? This, like, yeah. uh, uh, if, if anybody wants to check out the convention, uh, I have it on Facebook. It's facebook.com uh, slash Battlefront Game. And uh, that has all my event information for the events that we're going to be running from now on. Cool. Well, we appreciate it so much, and good luck, and uh, definitely mm -hmm. enjoyed it. It's always good to, to talk shop, and I've enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. You're listening to United Public Radio 107.7. I'm going to bed, but I love the show. I'm not going to bed. I'll probably go to bed, too, or something. <laughs> I feel like I need to go to bed. But anyway, I'm tired. Everyone have a good week. Take care, everybody. Good night. All righty. I think we are still live. Yes. And uh, still broadcasting. Hey, let me get, get on you for a minute. So I, I moved to Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. And uh, th this last weekend, they had a wizard, wizarding weekend, like Harry Potter.